hello guys welcome to the dms online school if you are new to this channel you are most welcome and on this channel i teach mathematics biology science and also revise past examination papers just as i'm doing now so if what i'm doing on this channel is what you're interested in please consider clicking the red subscribe button below and turn on the bell notification so that whenever i post a new video youtube will be able to send you a notification that the dms online school have posted this video and you'll be the first one to watch and take advantage of it all right remember subscription is for free if you have already subscribed no need to do that all right so in today's video i'm going to just revise science paper one the paper that was written on 11th november 2022 the paper reads examinations council of zambia examination for school certificate ordinary level please consider liking this video and comment in the comment section all right so without further ado let's go straight in the revision all right so this is question number one here so question number one reads a wire has a length of 1.3 meters and a diameter of 0.4 millimeters which of the following instrument will be suitable or most suitable for or to use to measure the length and the diameter okay so we have a length of wire of 1.3 meters and diameter of 0.4 millimeters now they're asking us the instrument which will be most suitable to use to measure length and the diameter okay so what you should understand is that the instrument that you use to measure any dimension must be one suitable and what they mean by suitable is one easy to use and two gives accurate uh, value meaning it does not introduce errors in the measurement okay so let's now use those uh, principles that i've given you to answer this question okay so here let's say length is 1.3 meters then diameter is 0 0.4 millimeters now for length they want us to choose which instrument should we use to measure it and diameter the instrument that we should use to measure it so when you look at length they are saying a micrometer screw gauge can we use a micrometer screw gauge to measure 1.3 meters no because 1.3 meters is is bigger length that is out of range of the size of the length that a micrometer screw gauge can measure so it cannot measure suitably and accurately this 1.3 meters here so next b rule okay so we, when we come to rule we are talking of meter rules like the 30 centimeter rule or 15 centimeter rule the one meter rule now now uh let's say we deal with the third centimeter row is it suitable for this one no because a third centimeter row is short so you have to measure several times to measure 1.3 meters so in those several times you are going to measure you are going to introduce an error all right now what about a one meter row a one meter row you have to measure this distance twice for it to be measured so in that repetition of measurement the first one and the second you might introduce the error all right so because of that the meter rule again is not suitable to measure this distance the next tape measure so tape measure in this case refers to the measuring tape so is the measuring tape suitable for measuring this distance yes it can measure even in centimeters also in meters as well so now because with measuring tape you just measure this distance once the probability of introducing an error is very minimal so the measuring tape is suitable to measure 1.3 meters how about vernier calipers vernier calipers the distance that they measure is out of range of this it's a very short distance so this one is way way too bigger than the distance that a vernier caliper can measure so vernier caliper is not suitable for measuring this distance here all right so here it is c now when we shift here also it must make sense as well all right so when we talk of diameter can we use diameter here to measure it using a rule no because 0 0.4 is way 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 too small than what a meter rule can measure accurately so meter rule cannot measure accurately 0 0.4 millimeters okay then we come to let's say vernier calipers here vernier caliper yes it can measure very very accurately here but however because of this other side so this one cannot be an option 
then uh, here B C micrometer screw gauge micrometer screw gauge yes it can measure 0 0.4 very excellently without any error because it is designed to measure very very small dimension so with this one it will be just a walkover so in this case this one qualifies here also it qualifies however which pairs qualify it is this one and this one so our answer is c okay so next we move to two so let me move to here so here the question is the following diagrams show a measuring cylinder and a balance used to measure the density of liquid x okay so they want to measure the density of liquid x so we have been told we have measuring cylinder here and then we have balance this one here is a balance and this one is a measuring cylinder okay so the question says what is the mass and volume of the liquid okay so they want the mass and and the volume of liquid what x okay so first of all they have put a measuring cylinder here with nothing inside and it's reading on in, in terms of mass on the balance is this mark here okay so now what is the reading shown here for us first of all to know the mass of the measuring uh, of the empty measuring cylinder okay so again you have to be careful whenever you are doing a measurement in science where you need to uh, understand the graduations on the measuring instrument so here if you have a 40 then what about each line here what does each line represent so you start like okay if this is 40 let's say if this is 10 20 30 40 it matches right yes so meaning each line represents 10 units so 10 20 so here it stands at 20 uh, grams so meaning the mass Let's say Me is the mass of the empty cylinder. So the mass of the empty cylinder is 20 grams. Okay. So guys, if you are enjoying this video, please consider clicking the like button there and also let me know in the comment section. All right. So now next, what they did, they added liquid X inside there. After they added liquid X, what happened? The, the mark moved from there up to somewhere where there. Okay. Up to somewhere there. So now we need to know now the mass of the liquid plus the measuring cylinder here. Okay. So what is the reading here? So if this is 120, 130, 140, because each mark here represents what? 10. So 110, 120, 130, 140. Okay. So now even here you can read it is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120, 130, 140. So the mass, if this one is mass of empty beaker and liquid X, then it should be 140 grams. Okay. Now we need the mass of the liquid X. So mass of liquid X will be now mass of the empty i mean mass of the empty beaker plus uh, liquid minus mass of the empty beaker or measuring cylinder sorry so here when you subtract you are going to get 120 so this is the mass of the liquid x now what about the volume of liquid x so volume when they added liquid it went up to somewhere 60 here so meaning if vx is volume of liquid x is so this volume is 60 cubic centimeters there okay so meaning here the volume is 60 then the mass is 120 so which one mass 120 volume 60 so our answer is b here all right so let's move to the next question question three reads the following diagrams show an, an stretch spring of 10 centimeter centimeters and a stretch spring of 22 centimeters when a force of four newton is applied okay so we have one this is the length of an stretched uh, spring which is 10 centimeters and here this is the length of okay this is the length of an stretched spring which is 10 centimeters and this is the length of a stretched uh, spring which is 22 centimeters after a force of 20, 10, uh, 4 newton has been applied to it now the question says calculate the length calculate the total length of the spring when a force of 6 newton is applied okay so guys this question is coming from hooke's law okay so this is hooke's law problem okay so you need to know hooke's law in statement and also in formula so what does it say hooke's law states that 
the extension of an elastic substance is directly proportional to the applied force provided the constant of proportionality is not exceeded okay so extension of an elastic object such as a spring is directly proportional to the applied force provided the um, extension limit is not exceeded okay that's what hooke's law does so hooke's law is just talks about a direct relationship like variation in mathematics so this is a variation problem in mathematics so in form of an equation hooke's law is written as force is equal to constant of proportionality times c uh, extension here now for you to solve this question there are two cases here Case number one, you find the constant of proportionality. Case number two, you find the extension after a force of six newton has been applied. So first of all, let's know the constant of proportionality. So data, so this force given here is provided to you so that you know what constant of proportionality is there. Okay, so you say, okay, extension, you are told. In this case, they add, they applied a force of 4 newton. Then the extension went to 22 centimeters. Okay, the stretching. So how much did it uh, did it extend? So the extension is equal to final length minus C original length. Okay, F final L length, then O original L length. So it is read as final length minus C original length. So it is going to be equal to, so final length is 22 centimeters minus, then original length is, um, what is this? Is um, 10 centimeters. So when you subtract uh, 22 minus 10, you get 12. So remember, I made an error here of adding uh, cubic centimeters there. That was just a typo error because sometimes what we do is... Uh, we pick other animated uh, characters somewhere there then we push them here to shorten the 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 process and which makes us also to to copy other things wrongly and fail to edit them later so now this is the extension 12 uh, centimeters okay so now this is data so you know extension 12 then you know the force in this case is Four newton that has extended it to this much so four newton and now you need constant of proportionality which is unknown then you start substituting you say force is a four is equal to constant of proportionality is unknown times c extension is 12 so you say okay four is equal to k times 12 it is 12 k now you want k so you divide by 12 divide by 12 here so this goes so you remain with k is equal to 4 divided by 12 you get 0 0.33 all right so meaning your constant of proportionality is 0 0.33 now you rewrite this equation as f is equal to where there is constant of proportionality you put 0 0.33 then you put your e there then after knowing the constant of proportionality now you move on into finding the total length of the spring so now you go to your new data data force you are given which is 60 uh, newton then they are asking you to say extension what is ex uh, uh, what extension does this force bring which is an unknown okay so now you need to know extension so you start substituting force which is 6 is equal to 0 0.3 times what uh, times e so times e which is also not known so you want e here so you divide by 0 0.33 here 0 0.33 so that when you cancel here you have e is equal to uh, 18.18 so this again there's an error as well transmitted here so this one you get rid of it okay so from there what you are going to do now is to do this so remember this is just extension if this uh, force is applied here this spring extends by that so now next you need to know now total length of this spring how it will be now in total in terms of length 
so remember we said extension is equal to final length which is now the total length minus original length so, uh, original length so final length is now going to be extension plus original length so which is going to be equal to uh, extension is the same one 18 18 here centimeters then plus original length was 10 so you put 10 there when you add you get like 28 here so again this one was transmitted continuously here okay so now what you do now you check which one matches this one it is c so your answer is c then you move to question number four which reads a motor is used to lift a load of 400 newtons through a height of 12 meters in 20 seconds what is the efficiency of the motor if the input power is 400 300 watts okay so they are asking for efficiency and then they have given you input power is 300 watts all right so there are so many formulas for calculating efficiency and if you are interested to learn online lessons for mathematics science biology please you can just whatsapp me on the number that is appearing on the screen mathematics is 60 kwacha per month biology is 60 kwacha per month and then science is 120 kwacha per month these prices are subject to change as time goes all right so take your chance to to book and please you can only whatsapp me if you have the cash at the hand because i'm not a scammer all right so now i was saying so the power the, the formula for calculating efficiency here would depend on what information that you have been given so we have been given power input power is 300 watts so efficiency in this case will be guided by this is power output divided by power input or output i input so power output then power input times uh, 100 percent now we need the data to place in this formula in order to find efficiency so data so we'll say power input we have been given which is 300 watts then power output we don't know here okay but we cannot worry here because we know power is equal to work over time okay but then we do not have work here but we know that work also is equal to force times see, distance so do we have force yes 400 newton distance through a height of 12 meters so we have distance here so what are we going to do now we we'll say power is equal to so meaning where there is work there will be force times see, distance which is the force which is 400 then distance which is 12 so it will be 400 times 12 here divided by time which is um 20 seconds so power is going to be equal to when you divide this it is 240 watts as your power output so this is your power output now so now after you know your power output what you are going to do is to replace here so we are looking for efficiency so efficiency is equal to power uh, output it which is 240 over power input 300 times c 100 percent so when you evaluate everything here you get your answer as 80 uh, percent so your answer is d here okay so 5 says the following is a table containing information about particles in different states which of the following or which of the substances is a solid okay the following is a table containing information about particles in different states which of the substances is a solid okay so they want us to to, to state the substance which is a solid so stub substance we have l m n o arrangement of particles spacing of particles movement of particles so let's look at the arrangement of particles fixed yes in solids they are fixed uh, then how about spacing of particles close together yes they are very close together how about movement of particles in solid very mobile not true here arrangement of particles are random no particles are not uh, in random in terms of arrangement so this one uh, no then here fixed pattern yes particles in solid are in fixed pattern uh, spacing of particles close together yes movement of particles only vibrate yes so in solid particles uh, are fixed in, uh, in fixed pattern close together only vibrate so our answer is c here then we move to question six question six says if a 1200 a cubic centimeter of an ideal gas is heated at constant pressure from 27 uh, degrees Celsius to 120 
seven degrees Celsius, what will be its final volume? Okay, so now look at this question. They're saying if 1,200 cubic centimeters of an ideal gas is heated at constant pressure, so constant pressure, then they're saying from what? From 27 degrees Celsius to 127 degrees Celsius, what will be its final volume? Okay, so here, for us to be able to answer this question, we must understand that it is coming from gas laws, and we have already covered gas laws in our online lessons. So if you are interested, you can join so that you can have that lesson alone. Okay, so now here, you must understand which gas law apply at constant pressure here. So at constant pressure, for you to remember, it's hard, but I've come up with a short way of remembering, which is this. I, come up, I came up with BCG and the TPN, which I remember as beautiful cute girls, 10 provinces. So B, Boyce Law, C, Charles Law, G, Guess Law. Then in T, temperature, P, pressure, V, volume. So I read it like this. So I say B goes with C, the first letter with the first letter. So this first letter, which is B, is Boyce Law. Then Boyce Law, then it says at constant T, temperature. So this one is Boyce law at constant temperature, okay? Then are we having constant temperature here? No, so we are not using Boyce law here. Then this second letter matches with the second letter here. So this one goes with that, meaning constant pressure. So constant pressure, what are we dealing with? Charles law. We are dealing with Charles law. Now, what does it say at constant uh, pressure? Uh, volume is directly proportional to temperature. That is it. Volume is directly proportional to temperature. So because of that, we have this formula here that we are going to use. And this formula is the one that we are going to use. So data, data is going to be like this. So we are told a one, if 1,200 cubic centimeters of an ideal gas is heated at constant pressure from 27 degrees Celsius to, to what? to 127 so it was from this to that so meaning this volume was at 27 then heated to 127 so this is a v1 so v1 is 1200 cubic centimeters okay then next t so this is t1 which is from meaning temperature number one which is 27 degrees Celsius, which can be converted into kelvin by adding 273 so we get 300 kelvin then it to 127 degrees Celsius. So this is temperature 2. So 2 is 127 plus 273, 400 when converted to Kelvin. Then they say, what will be its final volume? Okay, so the final volume here, now we are going to say question mark because we don't know it. So what we are going to do now is to make V2 the subject of the formula. So V2, the subject of the formula, it is going to be V1, V2 over uh, T1. So if you don't know how to do subject of the formula, then you just need to check on my channel. There's a video. Maybe I'll leave a link somewhere here. It will pop up somewhere here so that you can watch how to make the subject of the formula. Okay? It's a mathematical issue here. So once you make V2 the subject of the formula, then say V2 is equal to V1. You get this one. Now, 1,200 times T2, which is this one here. So you say 1,200 times 300, 1,200 times uh, T2, 400, yeah. Then divided by T2 is this one. T1 is 300 there. So when you evaluate everything there, you get something like uh, uh, 1,600 cubic centimeters. So your answer is going to be uh, B here, okay? Then question 7 says, which of the following is not an electromagnetic wave? Which of the following is not an electromagnetic wave? So, electromagnetic wave, uh, gamma rays, infrared, ultrasound, uh, uh, ultraviolet. Okay, so there's a way of remembering these electromagnetic waves. We have already covered that. So, it is uh, remembered by Rost is it? very unusual x mass gift so meaning those are uh, electromagnetic waves so electromagnetic waves are around seven there so is this one cut at the north ultrasound is not an electromagnetic waves so this is the answer here which of the following is not an electromagnetic wave is ultrasound 
Okay, now next we move to this question here, question 8. The following diagram shows a water wave. Okay, so this is a water wave, guys, here. So we have this question which says, which of the following correctly identifies the amplitude, trough, and wavelength? So here the wavelength is the distance from one crest to the next crest. Okay, then trough is the lowest point a wave can go all right from its neutral position or equilibrium okay then amplitude is the maximum displacement from the from the neutral point to the trough okay or rather the crest either the distance from the neutral point or equilibrium to the trough or the distance from the equilibrium to the crest so this is the uh, amplitude this is wavelength this is the trough so now we choose which one amplitude q yes this q here these two here okay then we come to trough error error trough error here we have error here okay so nothing has error yeah error here then wavelength wavelength p wavelength p p here so our answer is b here all right then nine what is the upper limit of human hearing so this question again wasn't phrased in a proper way. What is the upper limit of a frequency audible to the human or detectable to the human ear? Because this uh, remains vague as far as I'm concerned. What is the upper limit of human hearing? So in, in this case, they are talking of uh, frequency. Okay, so what is the upper limit of uh, human hearing frequency? Maybe that way. So you must understand that... Uh, upper limit of frequency detectable to the human ear is equal to 20 kilohertz. So this K stands for kilohertz. Okay, so you must understand that when you look at your answers, they're all written in standard form or scientific notation. So convert this one in standard form. So this one here, when we convert it into, into the other form, it means 20,000 hertz. So this kilo which is this one here, represents a thousand, okay? That's why it is 20,000 hertz. Now, they're writing this one into scientific notation, so it would be two times 10 to the power four hertz, okay? So again, if you want to understand these, may, lessons are already there. So the, the number is the one I mentioned earlier on. So when we check which one matches this one, it is actually D here, okay? So next, we move on to question 10, which says the following diagram shows a ray of light incident on a plane mirror at an angle of 90 degrees. So there's a ray of light that is incident on a plane mirror at an angle of 90 degrees, meaning the angle between the plane mirror and the incident angle is 90 degrees like that. Okay, then they're saying which diagram shows the refracted ray? Okay, remember here you use, you use the law of refraction, which says the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of refraction. Now, if the incident ray is incident at an angle of 90 degrees to the to the surface, this is the same angle at which the normal is to the surface. So, if the the the, the angle the ray is passing through the normal, then the angle it makes with the normal is zero. Okay, so also the refracted angle must also be zero. So which one makes the refracted angle to be zero? So it is A. So A is our answer. So when it comes like that, it must also be refracted in the same manner and it makes it zero or angle. All right, so this is the answer here. Then next, we move to question 11. Question 11 says, a transparent material has a refractive index of 2.0. What is the critical angle of the transparent material? Okay, no, they, they want the critical angle of a transparent material whose refractive index is 2.0. So you must understand that uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, refractive index with this symbol is given by number one, 1 over, then you say, uh, sine critical angle. So C stands for critical angle. So if you make critical angle the subject of the formula, you get critical angle is equal to sine inverse open brackets. You get 1 divided by a refractive index. So if you start substituting, you say critical angle is equal to sine inverse over, then 1 divided by refractive index, which is 2.0. 
So if you punch everything on your calculator, like let me just show you how I punch using my calculator on my computer here. Like uh, this is my computer. This is my calculator here. Let me push it like that. So I'll just get like one divided by two. Okay, what do I get? I get 0 0.5. Then I'll come here like second function. Then I say sine because this is sine inverse here. Push it there. It is giving me 30 degrees. Okay. So now I don't waste my time. So here it is 30 degrees. So the answer is A here as the uh, what? The critical angle. Then A12 says a steel bar was being magnetized using an electrical method yeah a steel bar was being magnetized using an electrical method which of the following will increase the strength of the magnetic magnet produced okay one decreasing the alternating current passing through the coil no 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 Actually, you cannot magnetize anything using alternating current, let alone even decreasing it. So this one is totally wrong. Then B, decreasing the direct current passing through the coil. Yeah, so you use a direct current to magnetize something electrically, but you cannot decrease it in order to increase the magnetic, uh, the, the strength of the magnet. So this one totally wrong. Then you see increasing the alternating current passing through the coil wrong because we don't use the alternating current. So this one is a totally completely wrong. Then it increasing the direct current passing through the coil. Yes, this one is a very, very good answer. So this is our answer here. Then next we go to question 13, which says the following diagram shows a steel bar being made into a magnet using double touch stroking method. Okay, so this question again we have double stroking method of magnetizing a substance so stroking method so we have a two magnets here being stroked this one in the other direction this one in the other direction so i must confess that i've never seen such a question below uh, before because i understand that um, you can never have uh, a magnet with the same pose then you call it a magnet i don't know but someone like my hod said these are consequential pose like which one should be the answer which diagram shows the magnet made so for me i consider this one it cannot make a magnet he said it can which one so b so b is the answer here so these are consequential pose because when you're stroking this way the end by which the the magnet strikes here if this is north this end will be south also if this is north this end will be south so it will be south south consequential pause according to the statement i was told so my first time here to know this okay so next we move to questioning uh 14 which says the following diagram shows a charged polythene rod which is moved near nd v of the metal sphere mounted on an insulating stand okay so we have a charged polythene rod which is moved near nd v near nd v of the metal sphere mounted on an insulating stand here okay yeah so we have an insulating stand here this is an uncharged what metal sphere here okay and then it has been insulated nicely then this is a charged polythene rod charged with a negative charge those minuses are negative charge then which of the following diagrams shows the correct charge distribution on the sphere the correct charge distribution on the sphere so you must understand that a law of electros electromagnetic electrostatic induction that um, uh, like charges repel and unlike charges attract okay so like charges repel so when you bring this one any negative charges that are here will be repelled on the other side then this side will remain with a positive so here positive here negative so which one matches that it is actually b here okay the next we move to question 15 which says the following shows the diagram shows an electric circuit with the two identical lamps one and lamp two connected in a series to uh, 1.5 uh, supply Okay, yeah, so we have lamp one and then lamp two all connected in a series. Okay, so to a 1.5 volt, then they're saying which statement is correct? A, 
both lamp one and lamp two will light with same brightness because they are at the same potential wrong these are not at the same potential then b light light one lights brighter than light two because okay lamp one lights brighter than lamp two because it is at a higher potential okay so this one to be to light uh, brighter than this one yes it is at a higher potential this one because eh, this one it is closer to the positive terminal which is at higher potential than the negative terminal so as electric electric charges come here they first enter here and they are used when they are used they remain with less potential then as they reach here this one will not light brighter so the answer is b let's not waste the time here let's go to 16 16 says the diagram shows a circuit containing two resistors in parallel while one is in series with the two with the two the electromag uh, the electromotive force uh, which is emf from the battery is 20 uh, volts okay 20 volts there so we have according to them they're saying containing two circuit two resistors so you have two resistors in parallel these two ohms in parallel uh while wow, one is in series with the two and this one is in series with the two then they are saying the final find the reading of the ammeter when the switch is open and when it is closed okay so when the switch is here when it is open what is the root of electric current the root of electric current is like this okay so meaning resistor three resistor two they will be in a series okay so when the switch is closed then this will be working so the total current also will pass from here and uh, through also the total resistance here then it goes to there so first of all for us to be able to tackle this question when they say find the reading of the ammeter when the switch is open and when it is closed we need first to know when it is open what will be the total uh, resistor here and then current so total resistors first total resistor r or total resistor when it's open is equal to resistor three here and resistor two here because when it is open here this is the path current will go so resistor two here which will be equal to total resistors resistor three is three ohms plus resistor two is two ohms then when we add the total we get five ohms so when the uh, circuit is open the switch is open this is the total resistance here now when they close here what will be the total resistance for us to know also the total current that will pass because total current in the circuit here that will be measured here it should be the total current that is offered by the total resistance of the circuit okay that's how it works okay so whether you put the ammeter here you put it there it doesn't matter where you place it so that now let's find the total resistance when the circuit is when the switch is closed you see when it is closed okay so you say is equal to resistor three okay then plus because when it is closed this resistance will be in effect uh, will be yeah will be effective and also these two will be effective as well so their total resistance here will be uh, when it, this is closed it will be resistor three plus uh, resistors in a parallel okay so plus these resistors in parallel first of all what is the resistor in parallel resistor in parallel is found by you multiply this times see, two times two then divided by two plus two there which will give you like what two times two four then uh, then two plus two again four so four divided by four one ohm so here in a parallel you have one so meaning you substitute here so total resistance when the switch is closed is going to be here r3 is a three plus rp which is the parallel is one so total resistance in the circuit when it, the switch is closed is going to be four ohms okay yeah so now after you do that now you calculate the current here when it is open and the current when it is closed so the current you know is connected by ohm's law which is the voltage is equal to then current times the resistor so we need current when it is open 
here the switch so current when it is open is equal to voltage divided by total resistor when it is open this one here which is going to be voltage is 20 then divided by uh, 5 which is going to be equal to 4 amps you see good then again we calculate also uh, current when it is closed the switch so we'll say okay voltage over total resistance when it is closed here which is equal to uh, voltage is the same guys which is 20 over resistor is 4 so when in current when the switch is closed is going to be uh, 5 amps so here it will read 4 when it is open when it is closed it will read 5 okay so current will be the same that passes there so which one open we need to have 4 where here closed 5 where here so the answer is a C the next we come to question 17 the following diagram shows a device that is used to generate electricity so we have a rotation there we have some magnets there we have um, a commutator here a split commutator and then a resistor so whenever you have a split commutator there and like this one brushes like that then you are dealing with a dc generator so this is a dc generator so so if this is a dc generator then let's see the next question so this is a G dc generator so the next question says which diagram shows the diagram which diagram shows the graph of the electricity generated okay so what diagram shows the the graph of electricity generated by a dc generator it is actually b here okay so let's move to another question 18 the diagram shows the structure of an atom this is the structure of an atom then they say which of the following shows the correct number of protons neutrons and electrons okay so you must understand that the protons and neutrons are in the center of an atom okay so this plus one here positively charged are protons this one which are charged are neutrons then electrons are found in shells so these ones with the negative are electrons there okay so these are electrons now the question is which of the following shows the correct number of protons neutrons and electrons so this was simple so we know protons are three neutrons are three electrons are three so when they say uh, proton one no proton three yes neutron three yes electron three yes so this is the answer b okay then in question 19 says which of the following equations correctly shows a fusion reaction which of the following equations correctly shows a fusion reaction so this is the answer the answer is actually a so remember guys there's a revision package for science paper one and paper two consisting of past paper revision in video form like these from 2015 to somewhere 2020 so this revision package for just papers in video form is going at 120 quarter so why am i even showing you this package i'm showing you this package because this question here just came in another exam the same one they just picked it and then brought it in this one here again so the point is these questions are almost repeated okay in any exam questions are repeated from other years there might only be two or three questions that may be new in that exam this is the experience that i've noted so you having the revision package you go through you have a high probability of knowing how to solve all questions that when you are going to sit for this exam most of the questions will be like revision and you write an exam like a revision okay so order that one remember 120 is not enough money for knowledge that will remain with you for years and years to come okay so this is the, the one which represents the fusion reaction okay all right then question 20 says given that the half-life of thoron is uh 52 seconds how long will it take for the activity 
of the thoron sample to be reduced to 1 over 64 of its initial value again these ones if you watched my other videos some of them are still on my channel you will be able to see that this question they just changed numbers but the format of questioning was just the same so that's why it is important to have these revision packages okay so now so you remember you are talking of half life 52 seconds then they are talking of how long will it take for the activity of the thoron sample to be reduced to that one over 64 of its uh, initial value so they are looking for how long you are looking for time okay so this question is tackled like this so you need to know the initial amount okay or original amount of a sample which when it undergoes some kind of half life then it remains the final amount now becomes this of its original or initial so original or initial amount now can be assumed in this case to be one you can assume in either two three four five six seven eight nine ten it's up to you i decided to choose one to make my calculations easier all right so if i assume that the original amount or initial amount before any disintegration of half-life of 52 had taken place this was the original amount which was there now after some disintegration what will be the final amount so this is the final amount of its original value or initial value so the final amount now is going to be final amount which is what they are talking about here it will be six one over six times one here which will be 0 0.015625 so after several half lives this was the initial that's what they are saying how long will it take for the activity of the thoron sample to reduce to that so if this is the original amount then it reduces to this how long does it take if one half life is 52 seconds all right so i will show you two ways of answering this question here so remember half life is like this if you have a mass of one gram here for, for example at the start so if it undergoes half life of 52 seconds it means you have to half this one when you half this one you get 0 0.5 grams again you half this one until you remain with this amount okay so again another half life passes you half this one it goes to 0 0.25 another half life of the same because half life is constant if it passes it goes to 0 0.125 another half life passes it goes to 0 0.0625 so i'm just dividing this by two okay another half life passes then it goes to 0 0.03125 another half life passes then it goes to 0 0.015625 this one now we arrive at this point so they're asking for this to have from here to here okay for this to reduce from there to here how long can it take so you start now adding this plus this plus this plus this time plus this time plus this time or 50 times how many one 52 times one two three four five six what do you get you get three twelve okay here here it is guys here it is so you say 52 times six you get three twelve so three twelve so your answer is d now let me answer it in another way okay so the other way i'll answer it is this so these are the formulas which are there in half-life or radioactivity total period is equal to number of uh, disintegration that have taken place times half-life then or rather uh, two to the power number of disintegration is equal to uh, original amount over initial amount or uh, two to the power number of disintegration taken is equal to original activity over final activity 
So now, here the steps are these. The question they're asking is how long? How long is time? It is period here. Okay. Now, for you to know this time, you need to know the disintegration that occurs for this amount to be arrived from any initial amount that you choose. Okay. So again, let's assume that the initial amount is one gram. Okay. So the initial amount is one gram, which is this one. Then the final amount is 1 over 60 times the initial amount, which is going to be 0 0.015625. So this is the original. So we need to find N using this formula here. Okay, this one here. So now we know now that this is our N. Now we come to choose this formula as our one we are going to use. We will say, okay, original amount, this one is 1 gram over then a final amount so here forget it i made again an error because i just copied this one here without rubbing this one so this one doesn't move with it this is just in like this one here okay so now so this is n which is this one this one which is that one so when you say 2 to the power n, 1 divided by this one, you get 64. So for you to get this n, you write this one in index form such that the base is 2. Okay, You get 64 such that it will have a base of 2. And then you look for, two, you look for a number to which 2 can be raised to in order to give 64. So I say 2 to the power n is equal to 2, which number... Uh, 2 should be raised to in order to give you 64 it, it should be uh, 6 okay like if you did like this on your calculator like 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 um say uh, 2 to the power 2 to the power 6 okay what do you get 64 so it is uh, 6 so 6 will give you 64 2 raised to 6 it will still give you 64 now in indexed form if the bases are equal even if the powers are equal so in this case we conclude that our n is equal to 6 so we have found n here so after finding n we substitute now to find the total so total time is equal to n is equal to 6 here times uh, half life here t half is half life 52 okay then after you multiply that one, you get 312 seconds, which means the answer is still the same. Okay, so section A, done. Let's move to section e, B. So section B, 45 marks. Okay, so answer all questions in this section. Write your answers in the spaces provided in this question paper. B1, figure B1.1 shows a part, shows part of a micrometer screw gauge. So this is part of a micrometer screw gauge. A1, what is the reading on the micrometer screw gauge? Good. So they want the reading. Remember, I predicted this one that they'll come. I also give guys the predictions. So if you want to subscribe, you won't see predictions because my predictions have been 80 to 90% correct. Okay. So people that have followed my predictions have actually done well in the exam because after I predict the topics that are coming and then they concentrate on those topics as well before going to an exam, they don't forget those topics that have ended up performing very well okay so now we are saying what is the reading on the micrometer screw gauge here so the formula for reading is this reading r is equal to many scale plus uh secular scale here okay i call this one secular scale times least count okay so list count what is this count the smallest size or dimension an instrument can measure okay so now um now we start substituting okay so many scale it's these values here you read from here then a secular scale from here this one is a constant it's already known stated the list count of a micrometer screw gauge is already known so how do we get many scale many scale you read the final uh, value at this line here so in this case you have a 20 now what it will be the units millimeters whenever a micrometer screw gauge is given without units labeled on it definitely you must choose the the original one okay 
which will be your is it original or what what can i say what can i say what can i say yeah maybe original something like that it is should be in millimeters okay so it will be in millimeters okay by default yeah by default if you have not indicated the, the the units here then the default one will be millimeters so this one is 20 millimeters the next you need the circular on this one here so the circular where do you take the reading on this line that aligns itself with the reading on the main scale okay this line and this line here they make one line they align as though it's one line that's where you take your reading from so this line here is a 30 so meaning you have your circular scale as 30 you don't put units here this one has got no units then list count list count is a standard if you are using millimeters on a micrometer screw gauge list count is always 0 0.01 millimeters but if you are using let's say they have given centimeters then this count should be equal to 0 0.001 centimeters but in this case we are using millimeters because they have not indicated so the default one will be millimeters so our list count here will be this then begin substituting so you say reading is equal to ms is equal to 20 then plus here then a circular scale is equal to 30 then it times this count is 0 0.01 millimeters there then you multiply okay so you multiply everything there now remember you are following board mass so board mass now will go like 30 first times 0 0.01 okay this one here 30 times this one you get that one then you add plus 20 plus 20 okay what do you get 20.3 so your answer will be 20 reading is equal to 20.3 millimeters so that that is the reading shown here then to state one use of a micrometer screw gauge so one use of it is to measure very small length okay very small length okay yeah it measures length and what size very small okay narrow rather then next we look at uh, b2 b2 says figure b1 b2.1 shows an object first weigh weighed in air and then weigh and then when it was immersed in water okay so figure b2.1 shows an object first weighed in air and then when it was immersed in water okay so when it is in air they measured the weight of this object here on a spring balance and then they also measured its weight when they had to put it in water there okay now the question says determine the weight of the stone in air so the weight of the stone in air is what so it is from zero up to 60 so it is a newton so this mark here you read this mark where it ends at this line here this is a sixty. this is a sixty. so yeah if this is a, what are they doing so this is a sixty. yes 40 40 50 60 70 80 yeah so this is 60 so the weight here is a, weight is a 60 newton so weight is in a newton again then it define up thrust again this was the first have a question here so in this exam this was a new question i'll be telling you questions which were new in this one this one has never appeared before so it was the new the the, the first new question that has appeared the rest that have ever appeared before in other exams so upper thrust is a force which pushes upwards on an object submerged in a fluid e.g. liquid so when you put this one here there's a force this liquid is pushing on the stone here so that force is called up thrust that's why this question when it came one of the guys said ah sir the exam was okay but i only didn't answer the question on up thrust yeah there will be questions like that in an exam which are new that will surprise you so an up thrust is a force which pushes upwards on an object submerged in a liquid or fluid, e.g. liquid. So that's what it was. Then next, the other part of the question was 
uh, part two here from the diagram shown in figure B 2.1 determine the up thrust of the water so we bring back this diagram here so they want the up thrust so the force that water pushed on this when this was placed here how much did it push very easy so when it was in air this was its weight it was somewhere here at this sixty. now when it was placed here it went somewhere to what to 20 somewhere there so if you say 60 minus 20 60 minus 20 how much force remains you remain with the 20 uh, 40 newton i mean so it's 40 newton there okay so that is the upper thrust of water 40 newton okay so let's push this one out then the same calculate the mass of the stone take g as 10 newton per uh, kilogram okay so they want the mass so mass first of all is calculated from weight is equal to mass times c acceleration due to gravity so make mass the subject of the formula mass is going to be equal to so weight over acceleration due to gravity which is going to be equal to data so you say weight you already found the weight of the stone when it was in air it was 60 newton then acceleration due to gravity you have been told it is 10 newton per kg then you are looking for mass which is a question mark then you substitute then you say mass is equal to uh, 60 divided by 10 which gives you uh, 60 kg so our mass is 60 kg okay next we come to this one which was also predicted in the prediction so figure b 3.1 shows a device used to measure temperature okay then this is the thermometer we know it and it has a constriction here so this is a clinical thermometer then they say define thermal expansion is simple thermal expansion is the increase in size of matter in terms of length area and volume due to thermal energy yeah so that is what thermal expansion is when you heat something it expands that thermal expansion is the increase in size of matter in terms of length area and volume due to thermal energy okay then in b one they're saying identify the parts labeled e and f so this part labeled e here it should be bulb this one is a bulb this part here then in this one f here is a constriction okay then a name a liquid that can be used in the device shown above so in this case the liquid that can be used will be mercury okay then in three mention one way in which the sensitivity of the device shown in figure b 3.1 can be improved so you can improve the sensitivity this one either by using large bulb so the bulb here should be large to increase the surface area okay so by using large bulb with thin walls and the walls must be thin or using a narrow capillary tube or capillary thread or tube so this tube here should be narrow so any change in the temperature sensed here can result to a large movement of this capillary making it very accurate okay so next we move to question b a which says two successful crests of approaching water waves are separated by a distance of 1.8 meters it takes three zero point three seconds for one crest to cover a, the distance of one point eight meters. Okay, then they say one at what speed is the wave traveling? Then two, what distance is covered by the wave? Okay, so first of all, let's draw a wave here. So this is a wave. Okay, so then that's telling us that two successful crests of approaching water waves are separated by a distance of 1.8 meters so these are the crests successful so these are crests separated by a distance okay which is the, the distance from here to here it's also wavelength so this wavelength of a distance 1.8 meters then they are saying it takes 0 0.3 seconds for one crest to cover the distance of 1.8 eight meters so for the crest to move from here to here it is taking time which is this time is also known as time period okay the time taken to make one complete wave so it is time period 0 0.3 seconds so this being time period then when they're saying the distance 
So there are two formulas to use here. We'll solve it in two ways. So you know, when they say at what speed is the wave traveling? So speed is always given by, speed is equal to distance over time, okay? So in this case, we'll say data. So we are told distance is 1.8 meters, then time is 0 0.3 seconds, then speed is unknown. Then I'll we'll substitute speed is equal to distance 1.8 over time 0 0.3, then which will give us this answer 6 uh, meters per second. So this is will be our speed. Now we have also, since this is a wave situation, we can also solve it in this way. So wave which has a speed is equal to uh, frequency times wavelength. Okay. So when we say data, we know that frequency is not given. Okay. But wavelength, we are told this is also wavelength 1.8. Okay. Then speed, speed is not known. So speed will be known if we know frequency. Now, can we know frequency? Yes. Frequency is equal to 1 over period. Do we know period? Yes, I said the time taken to make a complete wave like this one is also known as period. So you say, okay, frequency then will be 1 over uh, 0 0.3, which will give us a frequency as 3.33. Uh, so, so now, what you do is like this. Let me just bring it here. So, you got your 1 divided by 0 0.3 you got that one so in science your final answers before you, you you get the final answer don't round off so this rounding off here is just for storing this number here but on my calculator i have a 3.333 stored there then when i get back here i want now to find it i know frequency now now i i want it velocity so velocity i'll say Velocity is equal to our right uh, frequency. I found it is 3.33 times wavelength 1.8, which is this one. Now I'll go back to my calculator here where I had to store 1.3, I mean 3.33. So this value which was stored here, which is the frequency here, I was just I just cut it to shorten my space. I'll just say now times. It is the one remaining, so times that one, then 1.8, 1.8, okay? Then I say equals 6. I get 6 just like this one we got here. So my answer here is speed is equal to 6, again, meters per second. So in short, that is our answer here, speed 6 meters per second. Okay, so this one, I'll take it out, then the same what distance is covered by the wave in two minutes so they want the distance now if they are dealing with the two minutes what will be the distance in now two minutes okay so here i must have made an error two minutes i used two seconds so my answer was wrong but however the distance is like this distance is equal to um distance is equal to uh, speed is equal to distance over time so you make distance the subject of the formula distance is equal to speed times time <coughs> so you say data so speed is you already found speed here of the same wave so the wave has got the same speed at any time, it is two seconds. That's why I made the error. I quoted the two minutes as two seconds. Then distance is unknown. Okay. So then I substituted distance is equal to this times that two, which I got as 12 meters. Okay. Which was wrong. So here, what I needed to do was to change this one to this one. I mean, two minutes, two minutes to be changed to what? To seconds. So I should have multiplied by 60. 
so that it gives what one oh, 120 so you get 6 times 120 here so 6 times 120 seconds which will give you what 6 times 120 which is 720 so here the answer shouldn't be 12 no should be 7 20 meters covered now in a two um, minutes so it is so simple like that you can also say if 1.8 is covered through 0 0.3 seconds what about x distance and non which should be covered in 1 or 20 seconds then you multiply this times so that it will be 0 0.3 x then 1.8 1 1.8 1 1.8 times 120 what are you getting uh, 216 and then it divided by by 0 0.3 you are getting like 720 the same answer 720 meters there okay so we move on then b they're saying a calculate the frequency of sound wave with the speed uh, 340 meters per second and wavelength of 0 0.5 meters so they want what we calculate the frequency so we know wavelength is equal to uh, frequency times the speed is equal to frequency times wavelength now they want frequency so frequency is equal to speed divided by wavelength so say our data is like this so speed is equal to 320 this one given 40 i mean then wavelength is 0 0.5 then frequency and unknown so we we'll substitute so frequency is equal to 340 divided by 0 0.5 we get our answer as this 628 uh, uh, haze so this is our answer then they say could this uh, could this sound with the frequency calculated in b1 b head can we hear this sound yes it can be heard just find your answer to b2 so we can say because it is within the range of sound frequency detectable to the human ear remember the range of sound that we i said so the human ear is able to hear from 20 sorry for this problem going on here so human is able to hear from 20 hertz this is the range to 20,000 hertz so now this six eight has is within this range okay that's what i've said because it is within the range of sound frequency detectable to the human ear okay then the next we move to the next question b5 they're saying a infrared and radio waves are components of the electromagnetic spectrum one mention one use of each of infrared radiation and radio waves okay there are many so here i'm just going to mention all of them but you should have given one so like infrared are used in communication in remote uh, controls sensors also and the imaging so in imaging so like uh, when the coronavirus came people were uh, uh, being tested by those to my testers like a, 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 a touch or a gun which they were pointing at someone's head so those ones were producing they use um, uh, microwaves they use what not infrared so those infrared they detect your heat then that heat enters the sensors there 
then they'll be able to tell what temperature it is that qualifies to be said you are a coronavirus patient or victim or suspect. Again, you saw per my TV on airports in developed countries, people come and pass through like a TV, then as a TV, it scans them and it shows, it creates mappings of temperatures around their body. That is imaging now. So infrared are using in communication are used in communication in remote control sensors and imaging. Then what about radio waves, communication as well like radio, then uh, radar like communication in aeroplanes, navigation, medical applications and astronomy. So in medical application as well, sound waves are used to send signals like to in the stomach and also to check what is inside. So in communication, radar, navigation, medical applications and astronomy. Then to mention one common property of infrared, excuse me, and radio waves. So one, they both travel at the same speed in vacuum. Yeah, so these travel at the same speed in vacuum. Okay. Then in a three, give one harmful effect of electromagnetic waves. They cause cancer. So they can also cause cancer. Then we got to be. B, give one difference in propagation between sound waves and electromagnetic waves. So they specify in propagation. So you are going to say sound waves require medium, a medium for propagation while electromagnetic waves do not. Okay, yeah. So these sound waves, they require medium, electromagnetic waves do not. Then you see, mention one factor that affects the loudness of a sound wave, its amplitude of the wave. So amplitude affects the loudness of sound. Then next, we look at like D. D says, Elena sees a flash of lightning and hears the thunder after 4.5 seconds. How far is the lightning from the Lena? Take speed of sound in air to be 340 meters per second. Okay, so here, guys, that telling us that you know you are standing then you see a flash in the sky of lightning then later on you hear after 4.5 seconds sound now in your head now they're saying how far is uh, to your ears i mean how far is the lightning from the lena so how far has it moved from where they saw it to where they are then they're saying take speed of sound in air to be 340 meters so remember how far is distance so you just pick this one distance and speed that connect the speed is equal to distance over time so they want this distance here so you make it the subject of the formula distance is equal to speed times time then in data you know that time is 4.5 seconds then speed is 340 then it this uh, Sorry, this one should have been a distance here, distance and unknown. Okay, so this is distance. Let me just see. control it. This is distance. So you substitute distance is equal to speed 340 times times 4.5. When you multiply, you get the uh, 1530 meters so this is the distance you put there then in b6 we are told figure b6.1 shows magnetic field lines between the poles of two magnets so these are magnetic field line between the poles of two magnets then we have p q s t then these are the arrows showing the direction of magnetic fields. Then they're saying name point R. This point R without magnetic fields here it is called a neutral point. Then they're saying B. If P is a south pole, what are the poles Q and T? So if this one P is a south, definitely Q is a north. And at the north pole, that's where you, uh, the, the, that's where the fields originate. So the fields originate from the north to the south. So this one qualifies to be the north. So this Q is north. Then what about T? T here. So this as well, where the 
our fields are originating from this side is also north that one is south so that one is south okay next we go to b7 which says the figure b7.1 shows a graph of voltage v against time t when charging a phone a phone battery okay so someone is charging a phone battery here this is voltage in volts this is time in hours okay then a1 they're saying what was the voltage in the phone at the start of charging okay so this is the voltage this is time taken so at the start time was zero so at time was zero we go here what voltage is there two so the voltage there was it two so we'll say two volt okay then the next question uh a two how long did it take the phone to reach full charge so we bring back the graph so when do we know that the charge is complete when the graph goes horizontal so the graph going like this it means that charging is directly proportional with time as time is moving voltage also is increasing so the battery was being charged until somewhere at this point here when it started going horizontal time was moving voltage was not moving meaning it was a full so how long did it take so when you check this is the line where it started going flat so when you come this line is on the middle so this is zero one hour two hours three hours so this line on the middle here if this is four hours then from three hour to four there are 30 i mean 60 minutes okay now you are on the middle so you are at three hours 30 minutes so how long did, did it take three hours 30 minutes okay then what was the maximum charge voltage where it reached from here up to there the maximum charge when you check this line here you follow it this way if this is eight this is nine then i mean it the middle line here from there this will go up to somewhere on the middle here nine so it is nine volts that is 90 volts as the maximum charge where it goes to okay so now the next question here says um if the working current of the phone is 0 0.6 amps calculate one charge accumulated by the phone in two hours okay so this is another second qu new question that has appeared in the exam i said in each exam there might be one or two questions that are new totally new like this one here it's a new question okay so i've remembered just to remind you so they're saying if the working current of the phone is 0 0.6 amps calculate the charge accumulated by the phone in two hours so you know charge is connected by current is equal to charge over time so they want to charge charge is equal to current times time so you said data so you are told current is 0 0.6 amps then time is two hours so two hours change it to seconds time should be in seconds so you know to change the time from hour to minutes then to seconds so first of all you need to change the time to minutes how do you do it you divide whatever you are given you multiply whatever you are given by said to go to minutes now you need to take it to seconds so again you multiply it by sixty. now in, a, in an event you want to convert let's say from for the sake of just education from seconds to hours first of all you divide whatever you are given by sixty. Then again, you divide it again by 60, you get two hours. But our interest is converting from hours to seconds. So you get these two hours, you multiply it by 60, again by 60. So you get something like a time now in a second, it will be 7,200. So let me just do the demonstration. So two hours, this is your two hour time, multiply by 60 times 60. What do we get? 
7200 so that's the one then charge is unknown so you substitute okay so charge is equal to time current 0 0.6 times time 7200 when you multiply that one you get uh, 4320 coulomb c is the unit for charge coulomb so you put your answer there then uh, two power of the of the phone when fully charged so power in electricity is equal to voltage times uh, current times voltage it has so many formulas as well so now depending on what information you are given so now data current we know 0 0.6 amps voltage we know that the uh, when fully charged the voltage is 9 volt that we found then the power is unknown then we'll substitute so say power is going to be current 0 0.6 times voltage 9 then when we multiply this we'll get 5.4 watts as the power here the next we go to this question b8 so this question has ever come before so figure B8.1 shows a coil of insulated wire wound around a U-shaped core B and connected to a battery to make an electromagnet. Okay, so we have this U-shaped core with it coiled a wire to make an electromagnet. Then they say A, state the property of and A. So and A, you see, and A, what property are they asking in terms of a magnet they make? Is A north or south? So that's what they're asking for. So right hand grip, current flows from positive to negative like that. So this is the direction of current. So what you do when you check through this side here, you check through this side you see that current when it goes like that it is passing like that so the arrow is pointing here so this side the arrow points here then when it down there it's going like that so you draw a letter which looks like s in that manner so this one points in the direction this one this direction like that so when you look at this letter you turn it in right you see that this letter shows in north so meaning at A, we have north here. Also, when you look at point B here, you see that current is pointing like this, passing like that, like that, like that, like that. So if you were to view it from this side, you make a zero. So this line here, it's this one up here. Then the one down is this one. So up here, current is facing in that direction. Down there, it is facing in that direction. So again, if you were to draw a letter there, you find that it will make like that. So this one points in the at arrow, this one points in that arrow, this one points in that arrow, that one points in that. But this letter, when you look at it, it's S. So at B, you have south. So this is north, this is south. So state the property of ND A. So the ND A property is north pole. So this A here is north pole. Then we go to B. Describe one way of increasing the strength of this electromagnet. Magnet. So how do you increase the strength of this electromagnet? So this is an electromagnet. So to, to increase the strength of this electromagnet, you, you can increase it by one, increasing the number of the... by increasing the current in the wire. So when you increase the current in the wire, the electromagnetic strength will increase or increasing the number of coils. So you can also use the increase the number of coils. The more coils you have, the more stronger the magnet is going to be. And also using the soft ion core. Okay, this soft ion core should be a material made of a soft magnetic material like iron. Okay. Then here when, okay, I've already showed the answer. Eh? The question was what material must be used to must be used for the core. So we must use iron, which is a soft iron core. Now the next question is justify your answer. Why are we using iron? So we are saying iron is easy to magnetize and demagnetize. Yeah. So electromagnets 
are magnets that have magnetic properties when current is flowing and then do not have magnetic properties when no current is flowing so iron has that ability when a switch is on it becomes a magnet when it is off it becomes a non-magnetic material so iron is easy to magnetize and demagnetize then the next b9 which says define half-life okay b a one define half-life half-life is time taken for a radioactive material to decay by half of its original amount yeah so if you have original amount like uh, what original amount of a radioactive sample uh not this one you have um, one gram so one gram if it has to 0 0.5 gram That time it takes to move from here is what we call half life represented by T1 over 2. So half life is time taken for a radioactive material to decay by half of its original amount. Okay. Then the next now, we have this question here. Iodine 132.53 decays by emitting a beta particle to produce a new element. Uh, x e and a gamma ray write an equation for this decay okay so when it is something is a, a substance is emit, emitting a beta particle a beta particle is a fast moving electron so since it is a fast moving electron um meaning where does it come from it comes from a neutron turning into a proton so a neutron turns into a proton then and because of that there's an, a release of an electron that goes out okay as a beta particle so meaning that when a neutron is changed uh, the mass number stays the same but the atomic number increases that's what we know even from other videos so this one will be if you have iodine then it undergoes beta decay so this one which will be formed the mass number will be the same but atomic number will increase by one so it will be this the same atomic number increased by one because a neutron changes into a proton so this is a proton number then plus now this one is a beta particle now i forgot to write a gamma particle so you can also say plus a gamma particle which is just like this so a gamma particle has no mass has no charge so you can even write it like a y like that okay so this one is beta so this is your complete equation now okay then next uh, sorry let me do like this I give one property of a beta particle many properties but one is that beta particles have a charge of one negative one then b1 mention one medical use of radioactive substances many so they are used also in a treatment of cancer they have so many uses then if to explain the effect of radioactive substances on the environment many effects so mostly radioactive substances can emit ionization or ionizing radiation that can cause damage to living organisms including humans animals and plants then the next section c answer any two questions from this section in the separate answer booklet provided so c1 figure c1.1 shows the velocity and the time recorded for an earth rate running a, in a race mm -hmm. the mass of the earth rate is 75 kg so this is the data was that was collected velocity these are the values time these are the values then plot a velocity time graph for the results recorded in figure c1.1 b calculate the acceleration of the earth rate in the first uh, two seconds then c calculate one force the force the force that caused the acceleration in the first two seconds then to kinetic energy during the first two seconds of the race so let's start answering right away so let's plot this one 
So when we are plotting this, so bring our graph. So you label the axis first of all. So your graph title will be velocity versus time. Then this vertical axis is velocity in meters per second. The horizontal axis time in seconds here. Then next you start now marking the the vertical axis values that will accommodate these numbers here. So the lowest value you have is zero. The highest is ten. So you must make your graduation in such a manner that they must accommodate all these. So you must make your range from zero. So your range will be from zero to ten or twelve or eleven. So also here you are from zero to nine. So your range is from zero to nine or ten. So make sure the values here are lined up to accommodate these. So here, so I will just put here zero, the origin as usual. So here I'll say this is two, four, six, eight, ten. So it will be able to accommodate because I've gone to 10. Then here I've gone to 9, so I'll just say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So these values will be accommodated here. These values will be accommodated here. So I'll start plotting 0, 0 here. Then the next you plot 1,3.5. Now what we do, usually it is hard to, to plot these points here. Like unless I, I had a big graph paper where I had extended these, it was going to be simple. So like in this case, if this was going to be 1, I was going to manage to do it. Now, because of that, what I, I have done is this. So I rounded off. So this becomes a 4. This one becomes a 7. This one 8. This one 9. This one becomes 10. This one becomes 10. 10, 10, 10 throughout. So this one, I'm plotting a comma 4. This one was rounded to 4. So 1, 4 is here. So I'll put there. Then this is 2, 7. So if this is a 6, 2, 6, 7 is on the middle. This is a 6. 7 is on the middle here, that line. Then 3,8. So 8 is this one here. So then 4,9. 9 is on the middle here. Then 5,9.5 becomes 10. So 10 is this line here. Then 6,8.9. Also, I rounded it off this one to 10 here. Then 7,10, this one. Then 8,10, this one was rounded to 10. Then 9,10.2, this one also was rounded to 10, so 9,10 here. Then you, you connect all the points using your hand like that. So you connect your point like that. That is your graph. So next, here the same, calculate the acceleration of the earth rate in the first 20 seconds. So acceleration in the first 20, 10, uh, 2 seconds is here. So this is the velocity, this is the time. So you say either here you draw a straight line, then you find the gradient of that straight line. But however, this line, when you look at it, it is also straight here within two seconds. So you just say B acceleration is equal to final velocity minus initial velocity over time. So in this case, you can since this is this appears to be a straight line so you can just pick your initial velocity as zero or also you could have also picked it from initial velocity here but this appears to be a straight line here so your initial velocity will be zero your final velocity is where it is at two seconds so you say okay acceleration is equal to two uh, seven point one there 
minus zero over time taken is to there which will be when you divide this one you'll get like 3.5 meters per second square as your acceleration then the other question here says uh, c1 you calculate force that caused the acceleration in the first two seconds so you come here you say uh, force is equal to mass times the acceleration remember mass of the earth rate was 75 so you say mass 75 times the acceleration which i found here which will be equal to 662.5 newton as the force then you come back then you calculate the kinetic energy during the first uh, two seconds of the race so you come to find kinetic energy kinetic energy is equal to half times mass times the velocity squared so the kinetic energy you are finding it is within this speed here so you say kinetic energy half mass was 75 times velocity was 7.1 squared so when you evaluate this one kinetic energy will be equal to 1890.4 joules so we are done with this question then you go to the second question which is c2 a figure c2.1 shows elena viewing an activity over a wall fence using the instrument shown in figure c2.1 so there's an activity here then the learner is viewing this activity down here then they say name the instrument used then b i mean it to copy and complete figure c2.1 by drawing a ray of light to show how the learner viewed the activity on a stage so this is part a then part e says eh, figure c2.1 shows a glass prism with one of with one face labeled a b the refractive index of glass prism is 1.5. Define critical angle to copy and complete figure C2.2 to show a narrow beam of light which is dent on the face AB of the glass prism until it emerges out of the prism. Then to calculate the critical angle of the glass prism, then it's for give two uses of total internal refraction. So, you come back first you start answering the first one here so name the instrument used so this instrument is called the periscope so you call it part one periscope then two copy and complete figure c2.2 to show a narrow beam of light sorry sorry not here we are copying this one we copy this one copy and complete figure 2.1 by drawing a ray of light by drawing a ray of light to show how the learner viewed the activity on a stage so how did the learner view this activity how were the rays moving so this is the one we are answering here so you copy this one you bring it here then for the learner to see this the rays were coming from like that so these are the rays that's how you draw them now the rays are coming from here so you put the arrow there this one when it comes here it is reflected like that so here there are two rays pointing the direction that's the direction so they come like that so this is how you should have drawn it or it should be drawn then in next year, here now we come to b now where they are saying define a critical angle so critical angle b1 we are saying critical angle is the angle of incidence in a denser media for which the angle of refraction in a less dense media is 90 degrees yeah that's what the critical angle is then in two copy and complete figure 2.2 c.2 c2.2 to show a narrow beam of light which is incident on the face 
AB of the glass prism until it emerges out of the prism. So if there's a ray incident on this side, it comes. How should we draw the ray? So this is what they want. So two, we copy this one. So the ray coming here will come like that. Then when it reaches here, it will be reflected like that. So here, you draw the, the incident ray. Here it penetrates, no reflection. Then here it is reflected, and then it continues eh? like that. That is all. Then the next year, um so here there was just copy and complete to show a narrow beam of light which is incident so it's just a narrow they didn't say label and whatever then here complete the crit calculate the critical angle of the of the glass prism so this glass prism has a refractive index of 1.5 so to calculate the critical angle Critical angle, uh, refractive in index is 1 over sine critical angle. So make critical angle subject of the formula. So this is the formula. So you substitute sine uh, 1 over refractive index 1.5. So here you find that when you evaluate this one, your critical angle will be 1.8 degrees, which you can also put to 42 degrees even if this one is okay then the next year, give two uses of total internal reflection so two uses one internal total reflection excuse me is used in fiber optics to transmit light over long distances then two internal total reflection is used in refractive prisms which are used to redirect light. So also you can also in refractors they also use total internal reflection in refractors. So where light is redirected. Okay. Then let's look at the last question. C3. One define a define radioactivity. Okay. So let's define a radioactivity. So radioactivity is the disintegration of an unstable nucleus with the emission of three kinds of radiation then the next question so is radon which is 22286 uh, decays to form po polonium by emission of so this question has ever come on before and the previous one it has ever come before even in this one it has ever come before so radon that one decays to form that by emission of an alpha particle then they are saying write the decay equation so i'll keep the question here so that i track so alpha particle what are they it is just a helium particle consisting of um, mass number four and two atomic number so meaning this one the mass number here decreases by four then this one decreases by two in order to form polonium so this one when it goes to form the polonium so 222 minus uh, four here you remain with the 218 then 86 minus two you remain with the four then plus the actual alpha particle which is helium this one so make sure this plus this it should give you that this plus it should give you that so this is an alpha particle then the next year we go to this c figure c 3.1 shows the results obtained to determine the half-life of the radioactive element so uh, uh, uh activity in counts per second these are the values time these are the values then one plot a graph of activity against the time for the element so we'll plot so you get this one you are plotting this value so c which is one we bring our graph there so you put the vertical axis horizontal axis so vertical axis it is activity in count per minute then this is the time in minutes then you make sure that you also this one i didn't i didn't label i forgot to label so you label also the title so the title you say activity versus time here activity versus 
time the title here so now you also put these values such that the values here the range is from uh, somewhere 5 to 42 so your range is let's say from 0 to 42 then here your range is from 0 to somewhere 4 or 5 4 so now you make sure that the values that you put here they accommodate this range and then the value you put here they accommodate this range and must be uniform so here you put 0 then here you say 10 20 30 40 50 so i can accommodate these values here i've even gone up to 50. then next i put values here so here i'll just say 1 2 3 4 okay so but it has gone to 3.5 but i've gone to 4 so this range can accommodate these now you start plotting so this one will be 42 this one round them off so this one will be 19 this one will be 10 this one will be 8 to make your work easier because these points are so hard to plot especially like me having a small space here but if you are using a real graph like it is big you can also consider these as well so it was if it were in a real time like we are seated i have a graph i can completely show you everything if i had especially a proper camera or a phone that has high quality resolution i would have done that but my phone won't uh, allow me to do that okay so however this piece can help us so that's why i'm rounding these ones off so that i don't suffer a lot so now you start plotting like 0, 0,42 so 0 is here 40 so if this is the 50 so this is 50 then 51 or 52 okay this is 40 then 41 42 is the second line this line 41 the second one is 42 so at the second line here so 0 comma 42 the second line there you plot this one the next is 0 0.5 comma 34 so 0 0.5 is on the middle this is one 0 0 0.5 on the middle comma that one so comma what 34 so this is a 30 so 31 32 33 34 there so on the middle 0 0.5 comma 34 then here 1 comma 24 so this is 1 24 is somewhere here oh, 21 22 23 24 somewhere there then it took comma what no no no, no. 1.5 comma 18.5 so this one i rounded it off to 19 so 1.5 comma 19 so this is 2019 is somewhere below here so 1.5 comma 19 then 2 comma 14 so 2 if this is uh, 10 11 12 13 14 there then what 3 2.5 comma 9 so 2.5 is on the middle here comma this is 10 9 is somewhere here then what else 3,7.5 7.5 was rounded to 8 so 3,88 is somewhere here this is 8 okay okay then in i hope i've done the correct thing here 10 20 yeah so 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 yeah so this is 3.8 here this 7 was rounded to 8 then 3.5 comma 5 3.5 comma 5 3.5 on the middle here 5 also on the middle here then after that you draw a line from there this is a curve that you are going to draw like that now you find that this line may not pass through the points accurately so this is just a best fit so this line is in a decay curve so a decay curve it decreases with the time 
so that's how it goes so you make a smooth decay cave so you see that these lines are not as accurately as possible to give us a, a, a decay cave as we know it but because of that so i've followed this line this point this point this point this point and this point but there are points i've left out like here i've left out one point and these two points here so there's no problem with that so what i've drawn is the best fit line so next we come to this other question here which is saying now determining from the graph so this question four marks so determining from the graph the half-life of the element so you come back from the graph and I, rem I told you it should have a title in order for you to get all the four marks like here without a title you can lose one mark so you put the title there as well to acquire all the four marks so half-life is gotten by you get the original activity here so if you get the original activity which is 42 you divide you half it which will be 21 so you come on this on this side where activity is you come up at 21 this is 2021 20, is here you draw a line which touches the cave the point at which it touches the cave you go down then where you go down you read so if this is one 1.1 1.2 so meaning your half-life here you indicate here half-life is 1.2 minutes in minutes then in next we go to another question which says state one possible source of background radiations so the possible source of background radiation so background radiation comes from many sources so one of it is cosmic rays coming from outer space or we can also say concrete or concrete or concrete walls they contain elements that uh, also radiate uh, what is known as background radiation also in the soil in the ground contains this rocks that can also um, emit background radiation okay so guys we have come to the end of this revision i hope you have enjoyed it if you have please give it a like and also let me know in the comment section if you haven't subscribed consider clicking that the red subscribe button turn on the notification so that in the next video that i'm going to post science paper 2 for internals 2022 you'll be notified by youtube okay so guys for online lessons again the number is appearing on the screen physics uh, or uh, let me say uh, science uh, biology and mathematics science 120 then mathematics 60 quacha as well as biology 60 quacha these are my three charges okay bye peace